Welcome, everyone. I will begin uh, this part of the workshop supporting skepticism around the world. And I'm going to begin with a sort of short overview of some skepticism around the world as we begin exploring the one thing each of us has an idea for the one thing you can do to help foster and support skepticism around the world. First, let me introduce our participants in this uh, session. Leo Igwe. Leo, raise your hand. Everybody knows Leo. Uh, yes. Leo is a JREF research fellow and is uh, really doing, uh, uh, he's a sort of a lone voice in the wilderness fostering skepticism in Africa. Uh, publishes regularly on randy.org and has uh, published in recent months the Manifesto for a Skeptical Africa, which is really a blueprint for how to encourage critical thinking on the continent and really drawing uh, the lines between the need for critical thinking and the real world harm that results from undue credulity in Africa. And he will be presenting uh, more details about what's happening in Africa and then ways that we can uh, get involved uh, to support. Sanal Adamaruku is not here. You'll hear a bit about him in this presentation. He is on his way. Uh, he is, some consider him sort of the James Randi of India. He is a buster of God men, and you'll hear uh, more about that. Massimo Palladoro is a leading uh, uh, science educator and uh, uh, personality, really, in Italy. When we were there, I'm not kidding, uh, he, wa he was in the center spread of a, what was it, a Italy's version of Playgirl, Playboy, <laughs> something. Not nude, it was an interview uh, as, as a skeptic, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Read it for the skepticism articles, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, he's had a long time association with James Randi, and he'll be speaking about that later this weekend. Uh, Richard Saunders. Uh, at the end is uh, one of Australia's leading voices for skepticism, longtime association with the James Randi Educational Foundation and current president of the Australian Skeptics. He'll be leaving with me. And the one person uh, I save the best for last, my old friend Norm Allen from the uh, Institute for Science and Human Values, who has, uh, along with Leo, but really as an American, I can't think of any other person in America who has done more to foster skepticism in Africa than Leo. You've made how many trips? Uh, uh, I've made uh, seven trips to nine different African nations. Yeah, uh, over many years. So he's, he's doing really important work. So for my quick overview, uh, I could spend a lot of time talking about the various programs of the James Randi Educational Foundation focused on the United States. We do digital publishing and, of course, the amazing meeting, uh, uh, leading public intellectuals, really exciting folks on the program every year. You guys know Neil deGrasse Tyson, who has graced our presence a couple times, Adam Savage. We do international uh, cruises, sort of conferences at sea something I'm excited about that we recently did that in a sense has some international scope because it's viral online and it reaches people not just in the United States is action against celebrity psychics. So that is, uh, uh, we, we brought some uh, dead people uh, to speak to John Edwards because he said he could speak to dead people. We did a zombie uh, action against, uh, sorry, not John Edward, uh, James Von Prague. Uh, that I love that sign, use brains, psychics not real. Uh, and that viral video has uh, uh, achieved a lot of attention online and uh, uh, ink in Forbes and LA Times and elsewhere. We have these educational resources for the classroom. Uh, if you step out that door and to the left, you'll see our suite of eight classroom kits now. Uh, if you're an educator, you should avail yourself. Of course, the million dollar challenge uh, and that's what we're excited about working on today, Richard and me. But what we're here to talk about is international skepticism. And James Randi, over the last 30 years, you can really draw a line between uh, Randi traveling the world 
and skepticism starting in various pockets. In some sense, you might think of him as the Johnny Appleseed of skepticism. Uh, although if you see him later on today, don't tell him I said that, right? Uh, Randy, just in the last couple years, has had tours of India and Australia and uh, Spain and Italy and Germany and a, a nine-city tour of Canada in nine days and uh, Belize and Mexico and Honduras and I'm forgetting all of them. So various staffers travel with Randy as he works to educate the public through his uh, public appearances and media appearances. His trip in Italy, uh, uh, Massimo helped coordinate really a magnificent tour of Italy where Randy gave, uh, for one of these events, Randy gave one talk in a theater that was simulcast to dozens of other uh, theaters throughout Italy, and that was sold out events. So that's a really exciting way uh, that Randy is able to bring the skepti skeptical message all over the world. This is Randy in India. Uh, I just mentioned uh, the Italy tour. This is Northern Europe. Uh, an impish magician traveling the world, sowing seeds of doubt, but always with a smile. Uh, you wouldn't know it by his posed pictures because he, he excels at this skeptic uh, scowl, but uh, when he performs, uh, you really enjoy that, uh, that happiness that bubbles out. So I'm going to re briefly survey skepticism around the world in India, the United Kingdom, Africa, Canada, and Australia. Uh, Leo and Norm will expound on what's happening in Africa. Massimo will talk about what's happening in uh, Italy and uh, moderate further discussion. And uh, uh, briefly, uh, Richard will also talk about some of the stuff happening in Australia. I'm very excited about what's happening in India, and I look forward to Sanal getting here uh, because uh, he uh, is an example of what someone who cares about our shared values of critical thinking in the public interest, skepticism to mitigate the harm resulting from undue credulity. He's a perfect example of the positive effect one can have. Uh, uh, he, he may already be here through the mystery of bilocation. I'll check. Uh, so now, last April, of the Indian Rationalist Association, he conducted an investigation of a reported Catholic cross that wept tears. And he discovered that it was actually just a leaking drain uh, uh, that s dribbled off the uh, crucifix. Nonetheless, the cross had developed a lot of uh, attention uh, publicly and in the media in India uh, as a holy miracle. His expose, of course, uh, revealed that there were natural explanations, but the act of exposing uh, that the uh, crucifix was not weeping violated section 295 of India's penal code, which, if you can believe this, prohibits, in quotes, the hurting of religious sentiments. So warrants were issued for Sanal's arrest, he was forced to go into hiding, and, uh, and this is after many years of uh, his sort of jutting up against people like the Godmen, Indian gurus like Sai Baba. Uh, Sai Baba did recently die, but there are many others. Uh, we think these folks are just magicians and not even very good magicians doing sort of impressively bad sleight of hand as part of their religious presentations. Um, India has a long tradition of rationalists. I'm not even talking uh, in historic in India, uh, uh, but uh, just in the last hundred years, there's uh, Pamanand and uh, Narendra Nayak. Uh, all of us know uh, the Indian uh, rationalists who have been really traveling the subcontinent, training skeptics, what's very exciting about what's happening in, Indi in India, and I know of no other place that this is happening except Northern Europe. Uh, the Indian government actually pays for and subsidizes the skeptical education of youngsters through these, call them sort of road shows, that uh, Nayak uh, conducts. He's another Indian rationalist. He's the president of the Federation of Indian Rationalist Associations. 
and he teaches science and skepticism to youngsters on these tours. Uh, effectively helping encourage the next generation to combat the harmful superstitions of the godmen and notions, uh, cultural notions like the castes, etc. Uh, we were happy to meet with all of uh, the leadership of the Indian rationalists on a recent tour of India. And what's very exciting, as I mentioned, is that he receives government funding. So that's the paradox. There is something in the penal code that gets Sanal in trouble for exposing a weeping cross, yet because of the Indian Constitution, uh, specifically Article 51AH of the Indian Constitution, he receives money, Nayak receives money to travel and teach skepticism, scientific skepticism and critical thinking. Article 51AH says, uh, that as part of the Indian Constitution, it is a goal of the Indian government to develop the scientific temper, humanism, th and the spirit of inquiry and reform. So under that article of the, of the Constitution, there is a substantial budget for this sort of public education running counter uh, some uh, penal uh, uh, codes of various jurisdictions that get folks like Sanal in trouble. There's a robust online uh, skeptical community in India and uh, I was really uh, gratified uh, to discover how robust the local grassroots skeptics were in India. Not that they have regular uh, uh, Anglo-seeming skeptics in the pub gatherings, but they have regular meetings. And uh, you know, we knew skeptics uh, to, to travel. Uh, one traveled nine hours by uh, train just to hear a uh, talk from Randy. So skepticism is, live and, uh, is alive and well uh, in India. In the UK, I think many of us are more familiar with what's going on in the UK. That's of course where skeptics in the pub and pubs uh, sort of got their start. Uh, in India, uh, was, uh, uh, it was the location of the launch of the 1023 campaign. How many people uh, uh, here are uh, familiar with the 1023 campaign, the homeopathy overdose campaign, really inspired by uh, Randy's overdose of uh, homeopathic sleeping pills. Uh, there are resources online uh, to help folks all over the world reenact that to educate the public about the um, irresponsible claims by, uh, sometimes I call them homeopathetics. Uh, <laughs> but there's a lot of citizen uh, skepticism around issues of chiropractic and homeopathy. Simon Singh, in his public education, has sort of inspired a grassroots activism around chiropractic and reporting uh, chiropractors that's had uh, a great effect. I mentioned the 1023 campaign. It's really an online website that equips anyone, not just folks in uh, the UK, uh, to do a, uh, an action, an event in their neck of the woods to raise the alarm bells about uh, homeopathy. I'll leave the lion's share of talking about Africa to Leo and Norm, but what's really exciting uh, from the JRES perspective right now about Africa is the work of Leo Igwe. I mentioned the manifesto for skeptical Africa, for a skeptical Africa, and the issues Leo uh, raises the alarm bell about include uh, witch burning and uh, uh, albino superstitions that lead to uh, uh, something tantamount to can cannibalism because of the religious views or I'd say superstitious uh, views of um, uh, folks in Africa. There's AIDS denialism that has a, a great negative effect. And uh, so you see how the ambitions and the goals of skepticism intersect with real world problems in the continent. Uh, Leo really, um, uh, is an inspiration for uh, folks uh, who naturally want to just get together, have a, a pint or a beer, and talk about another reason why ghosts don't exist, or another reason maybe why God doesn't exist. He's in the trenches, uh, uh, really defending the barricades. In Canada, there's a lot going on, and you don't really think as an American of Canada as international skepticism, but if I didn't mention it, I. Uh, imagine I'd get an earful from a couple good friends. Uh, they run an analog to the uh, to PSYCOP or the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry called the Committee 
for the Advancement of Scientific Skepticism, CAS, and they took in Toronto and Vancouver and other big cities a bus campaign raising questions about paranormal and pseudoscientific claims. Uh, the, um, the extraordinary claims bus campaign, they call it, and here's an example of it on uh, a bus. Uh, they're working with the James Randi Educational Foundation to conduct a live million dollar paranormal challenge in Toronto later this year. And what I really like about the international skepticism is it shows so much promise for collaboration among national organizations. You'll hear from Massimo uh, probably how uh, uh, CHICOP has for decades worked very closely with SICOP and JREF uh, to advance our shared aims uh, in each country. Uh, in Canada, they've uh, also uh, done the 1023 campaign, uh, and, uh, and I mentioned the Million Dollar Challenge there. Australia, uh, there's a lot going on in Australia, and uh, uh, Richard will uh, touch on it as well, but what I want to focus on is uh, the skeptic school. So who knew that a skeptic uh, uh, middle school teacher, we call the middle school teachers, uh, uh, can have a whole program uh, educating youngsters in specifically scientific skepticism. It's not an atheist club, it's not an agenda-laden uh, uh, campus group, but it's about method and critical inquiry, and that's an inspiration. There are a lot of uh, public intellectuals and figures in Australia. There's Richard. Richard may touch briefly on uh, one of the greatest hits of contemporary skepticism, and that's his busting of the power, or he and his group's busting of the power balance uh, bands, and there are still a couple of them floating around. Now JREF has a placebo band made by the same manufacturer with the logo, uh, the hologram instead, the JREF logo instead of uh, the power balance. Uh, we're out of them right now, but more are in order. In Australia, they've done yeoman's work around the issue of vaccines. Uh, we, just a lot of, of, of fantastic work there. Um, and so uh, with that, that's a sort of really quick uh, um, overview of some of these points of skepticism around the world. And I'm going to pass it to Richard now so that we can run uh, and do this other thing. If Richard wants to talk a bit about uh, other things in skepticism. And uh, before I do that, uh, every one of these presenters today have a lot of experience, uh, uh, yes, advancing skepticism, but realizing it's not one size fits all. It's not what happens in New York City may not be as effective in Nigeria, even though the agenda or the aims of skepticism uh, in the public interest are identical. Um, I'll, I'll leave you with my one idea. Uh, for how you as a skeptic can help foster skepticism around the world. How many of you, just by show of hands, are involved in a local skeptics group? So I think that's the lion's share of folks in, in here. Um, so I propose, not a formal structure for this, but when you go back to your neck of the woods, um, and after hearing the presentations by uh, our other presenters uh, today, identify a skeptics group somewhere else in the world and connect with them. You can do that through randy.org where we have a listing of skeptics groups all over the world or uh, PSYCOP also has a listing. CHICOP also has some listings like throughout uh, um, Italy, etc. And uh, adopt one of them or let one of them adopt you too. So in other words, rather than sister cities, let's have sister skeptics groups and share ideas and resources and I think more important than uh, something programmatic where one group says, this worked for us and you should do it too, I think the communication is vital in and of itself. It fosters, uh, can we call it without sounding too grandiose, a worldwide community of skepticism. And uh, if you look at the, the intellectual history of the, uh, let's say, the conservative movement of the United States, uh, um, when they started, they were sort of a laughing stock in the early 70s. No one, th people thought the secular left had won. You know, there was gay lib and women's rights and uh, civil rights and all of that. And some folks got, got together and said, you know, we have to have a long-term plan for affecting culture. 
Um, not only did, did they build institutions, that's what organized skepticism is trying to do right now with organizations like uh, PSYCOP and JREF and Shermer's uh, organization, but they said we need to support the grassroots and not just grassroots locally but around the world and so but to argue by analogy, and I know many of us would bristle by this, but you know there are a lot of local evangelical churches who support and learn from other churches in other parts of the world. We are not churches. There's no such thing as a skeptic foot soldier. Uh, we all uh, suffer from, uh, or I guess benefit from, qualities that will keep us from ever being too church-like. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we can, we can learn, uh, I think, from the model of this communication cycle where we really, uh, as local skeptics groups in the United States, really try to connect with international groups. And maybe Leo and Norm will also have things to say about that too. So with that, uh, I will pass it on to Richard Saunders. Technology. We're getting these in Australia next year, actually. I think. <laughs> Electricity comes the year after that. First, we get used to these. Thank you very much, DJ. And folks, let me begin straight away by uh, uh, just letting you know and apologizing. I won't be here for a long time, so I won't go on too long, because DJ and I have other commitments here at the amazing meeting, which we hope will um, be very exciting for everybody. In 1980, uh, a magician visited Australia, a little magician with a white beard, um, and conducted a very famous set of water divining uh, tests which were filmed. Within a year, the Australian <coughs> Skeptics was formed. That's exactly what DJ was saying. His Randy going around the world inspiring people. Now, this is 1980. In 1981, the very first issue of our magazine, um, with great imagination, it's called The Skeptic, appeared. Um, and I would be not doing my job unless I told you that at the end of the hall, you'll find the Australian Skeptics table, where you too can try your hand at water divining. And more importantly, and I make no apology for this, we would encourage you and this gets back to supporting local skepticism, what Americans can do or the international community can do to support us in Australia. One of the most tangible things you can do is subscribe to our magazine. And you can do it online and you can get our magazine, which has been going since 1981, delivered to your email four times a year. And not only that, if you're really cheap about it, you can go to our website, www.skeptics.com.au, and uh, feel free to browse over 30 years, what is it now, 32 uh, years or whatever it is of our magazine, which are free for you to read online. You can just help yourself. The latest issue is obviously a subscription, but after a year or two, you're free, and we, we feel that's a valuable resource for everybody around the world. Thank you very much, DJ, for mentioning the, the power ban situation to me. Uh, it's hard for me to take so much credit for that, because obviously no one person does all these things. I was in the very fortunate position of being able on national television to test the Australian representative of power balance and he, which I will be talking about later, he failed five out of five tests and it was quite excruciating. That avalanche into a series of events which eventually brought down the power balance company but strangely enough and we remember the slide of the skeptic school not long after that was happening, in fact, not long after TAM Australia in 2010, I was visiting Melbourne with a couple of the people from TAM Australia and we gave a public talk. In that public talk, I gave the power balance demonstrations. Uh, the teacher you saw in that picture, Adam Van Langenberg, was there in the audience and that demonstration inspired him to then go on and form his uh, skeptical club in his school. And I was very honored to go and speak to that club not long after that. So isn't it strange that something like power balance led to the formation of a skeptical club in a school? So every cloud, I guess every cloud has, has a silver lining. DJ was very kind when he was mentioning some of the enormous successes we've had in Australia, especially when it comes to the anti-vaccination crowd. 
And uh, I am very fortunate to be president of just simply the most dazzling committee of the Australian skeptics based in Sydney. And there are other skeptical groups, obviously, around Australia. But the dedication and the, the work they go through, and I know that there are some Australians in the audience hand up, hands up. Holy moly, there's more than I thought. <laughs> now, can you imagine, folks, for me, being the president of Australian skeptics here in Las Vegas, to look at a room this size, the number of people in here, and the percentage of Australians who are so interested in skepticism, they've come here to the amazing meeting. That's, that's great. That, that fills me with great confidence. And I'm so pleased to see so many Australians here supporting the JREF and supporting international skepticism. But getting back to the core of people I work with, the tireless work they've been doing over years with setbacks and setbacks and setbacks, it's really, really bearing fruit in Australia with now members of our federal parliament standing up and making speeches condemning anti-vaccination and anti-vaccination groups. I'm just gobsmacked. It's so heartening and, and it's, such, it's such good news. Um, apart from that, we still keep our, our roots, our, skept, our skeptical roots in the good old stuff. And I particularly think of water divining. In fact, earlier this year, I took part in the largest test of water divining ever held. And we did, we did this in the state of Victoria on a blazing hot day. We tested, or there were runs of over 80 or 85, I, I haven't got the exact figures, of water divining. People from all over the country came, the, the classic water diviners, mums and dads, and everybody had a go. And we report on that on the magazine. Now, some people would say it's... Why? After all these years, even James Randi did it originally all those years ago. Uh, why do it? Why don't you just devote all your um, efforts to things like anti-vaccination and, and other issues? Well, I think it's really important every now and then to remember where we came from. And doing something like water divining not only puts us in touch with where skepticism came from or one of its, its roots, it also gives us a chance to interact with real true believers and really nice people and run tests and understand the psychology of running a test and the protocols and everything you have to do in dealing with people. Don't underestimate those important things. And we'll be testing water diviners again. It doesn't mean that we then don't put our efforts towards what we may consider more important things. Of course, of course we do that. But don't forget it's important to keep the basics. Look, look at the research for UFOs, Bigfoots and monsters. They're good fun. That's why I got into skepticism. <laughs> I really did, but I do realize that we have bigger fish to fry, which we do, and one of the um, members of the Australian Skeptics Committee, Joe Benamou, is here in the audience. She's also involved with a group, Joe. <laughs> Joe Benamou is, is involved with a, a very worthwhile group in Australia called the Friends of Science in Medicine. It's a group of academics, professors, and so on, who are fighting the encroaching um, alternative medicine modalities in our universities especially, and making the universities, putting them to account, saying, why are you teaching this? This is out without scientific foundation. It's, it's an important battle too, very important, and I'm very pleased to be, uh, that the Australian skeptics are in some way involved in that. Getting back to how you can help again, let me say, I encourage you to ha come up to our table. Please look at our magazine. I hope you will sub subscribe. That does help us enormously. It's getting back to generating income and funds so we can keep doing what we do. And I hope and I know that our efforts in Australia do inspire other groups around the world, which is just what more could you ask for, I guess. It, it's really heartening for someone like me to see that. Apart from that, we. We have an, a lot of fun in Australia, but I'll leave you with this note. In this November last year, we had the Australian Skeptics National Convention in Melbourne, and one of our special guests was James Randi. He went to speak at that very school uh, where Adam van Langenberg has his skeptical uh, club in front of a huge audience. It was a record heat wave on that day in Melbourne. It was over 100 degrees. The auditorium air conditioning failed, and Randy still did his show while the rest of us were sitting backstage trying to cope with the enormous heat. 
I think DJ was flaked out on the floor somewhere. I, I don't know where he was. <laughs> Also trying to talk Randy into leaving. This is too hot. We too hot. We're and we're. Oh, the show must go on. He's yeah. doing his thing, and we're we're ready with the stretcher any minute now. This poor guy. Someone brought a fan on stage, which was useless because it was too hot for a fan. There was cups of water, and if I if I had respect for James Randy before then, I have even more now that he battled through the most atrocious conditions to pass on his message to the school kids. That's so. Yeah, it was it was something. I mean, um, if I'm doing that at 84, I'll, I'll be pretty impressed myself. <laughs> so that's what's happening in Australia. Please come and visit us at the table. We have mustics for everybody. <clears throat> Thank you. Come and say hi to me. Uh, Joe Benamu and my other friends from Australia will be there and some uh, other helpers from around the world. And uh, with that note, thank you very much. Thank you, then. Uh, bye, DJ Richard. See you later, then. So now, we, know, we don't have it, right? It's, it's, it's uh, disappeared somehow. It's not arrived yet, you think? You'll try to find it and send him over here. OK. So good friends, um, we have about uh, a bit less than an hour, I think. And uh, so we're going to hear your presentations. And we have. Also, a bit of time with uh, for your questions. I think it's interesting to interact a bit. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Italy, what we're doing and what we uh, are hoping to do in the future. Italy's group uh, named CICAP, uh, the name was chosen. It's a long name, Italian Committee for the Checkup Controls, was chosen just because it sounded like Checkup, CICAP. Not one Italian got it, of course. <laughs> uh, but we keep the name even though we are changing the, the, the whole uh, wording of it because the paranormal in Italy, uh, it's always alive, but it's, it's something of the past. I mean, we were born like in, at the end of the 1980s where you know, still you get the Uri Gellers, uh, all the table lifters, uh, douses, and so on. But now, today, it's more fringe science. It's more conspiracy theories and uh, urban legends and, you know, very well. How it is so uh, it, to identify yourself as paranormal investigators today sounds a bit uh, in Italy at least uh, in, in that context sounds a bit outdated and you also put yourself like a, an odd character in reality you're talking about science you're talking about how to approach um, and how to uh, promote critical thinking anyway um, as I said we were born about 25 years ago next year it's going to be our 25th uh, anniversary so we have a big conference coming up and uh, and we have a we've had a chance to investigate like really dozens and dozens of cases and uh, expose many uh, frauds and, uh, and not only frauds but also investigate um, normal people that really come to us thinking they have paranormal powers and maybe on my talk on Sunday you will see some of ex some examples of this uh, as Randy does because the, the million dollar challenge is, uh, is, is valid all over the world and we perform the uh, the approaching tests, let's say. If they pass our test, then they go to, to do the test with Randy. Of course, nobody even passed the, the, the preliminary test, right? However, since we have uh, uh, the support of all the, the major scientists in Italy, Nobel Prize winners, and the founder of our committee is a um, science journalist who in Italy is popular, like it would be Carl Sagan or Richard Dawkins. So uh, very, very prominent figures since the end of the 1960s. Now he's as the same age as, uh, as Randy, but he still has his primetime science TV show uh, on national television, which is the still, I mean, it's now many years, the most seen uh, TV show when it is on. He was our uh, founder, and uh, through him we were able to get the support of all the scientific community in Italy. And that allowed us to have a credibility in the beginning with the press, with the journal, with the public. And with that credibility we built in 25 years um, like a, a point of reference for the public and for the journalists, and, and today we have an office uh, we have a, a staff of two people that are being paid. And the only way in which we raise money, of course, is not by public fundings, by state, whatever, but subscription and, and uh, memberships. 
we have members all over Italy, not, not that many. You think that uh, uh, in order to, to do what we do, because we, as I said, we have a staff working with an office, uh, we publish a magazine, we keep lectures all through Italy, we have uh, about 15 local groups that we maintain and that you organize uh, activities in the territory. We perform tests. Um, we're on television, on radio, and uh, we, we write columns in many newspapers and magazines. So we keep the message alive in many forms, podcasts, uh, videocasts, and so on. Um, but as I said, since we don't receive any fundings, uh, we have to rely on memberships. And we had, uh, you know, Europe is passing still, is passing through a, a crisis. And, uh, and we saw our memberships slowing down a lot. So last year, like a few months ago actually, we, we issued a statement saying that if we, if, if we were not able to raise, to double at least our memberships, we could not survive. And in two weeks, the memberships doubled. That was quite impressive. But what we found out is that our supporters, the people that follow our works, which are um, on Facebook and, and Twitter and whatever, you count them in tens of thousands because they subscribe and you, you see them, uh, did not even realize that we needed that kind of support. We saw them, they, they saw us uh, doing so many things that they thought they don't need it. So what we found is that you have to tell them, you know, uh, that's, that's helpful. We need your help, otherwise we cannot perform. And um, well, but our situation, again, maybe is, is, a, is a lucky situation because uh, we have uh, so much support. There are other realities where the, the, it's much more difficult, and I think that, what, that is, this is what we are going to talk about now with our guest. So I would like to ask you which one would like to, uh, go, to go first, maybe? I have to set up you have to set up your computer. OK. While he's going, you may, be, you may set up your computer. OK, then. OK, I, I've known Leo for quite a while now. Uh, he started his group way back in the 1990s. And uh, we've been working together. And um, I've had the opportunity, as I said earlier, to travel to Africa. But not only Africa, I've also been to Latin America. And I would like to discuss a little bit about Latin America, too, because that wasn't mentioned earlier. Uh, during my trips to Africa, I've uh, come across a lot of uh, problems. And I've come across a lot of differences in culture. And uh, DJ was saying earlier about how when you go to different parts of the world, they have different, uh, different ways, and they have different, um, you have to respond to different situations differently. And so uh, when I went to Africa, I, I noticed that there were some similarities, but there were also some major differences in uh, skepticism and the, the types of, uh, the types of uh, problems that they had to deal with and the types of approaches that they would need to deal with. Uh, when I first went to Africa back in 1991, I didn't go as a skeptic primarily, I went as a, a humanist. And uh, they had problems in that there wasn't much in the media about skepticism, about humanism, or free that. And so when I went there, uh, it was the very first time that they had a major presentation of humanism in the media. They had the Ghanaian Broadcasting Corporation, which was the only television station they had in the entire country. But it was the first time they had uh, exposure to secular humanism on their uh, national television program. And uh, they also, to a lesser degree, had it on their national radio program, the Ghanaian Broadcasting Corporation. And so uh, it was history making. and. Uh, when I was there, we had front page news in their, in their newspapers and everything. So it was very good to uh, finally be able to go to that nation and to have humanism presented. Uh, after it was presented, they had a program on the Ghanaian Broadcasting Corporation called Contemplation. And they were inviting various religionists from all over the country to discuss their views. They would have people on there from the Mormon religion. They would have people from throughout various Christian religions and Islam. And after my presentation, uh, we had a local group there called the uh, Rational Center. And so they decided it would be good to finally have some humanists on a program. And so uh, the humanists were able to finally go on national TV and present their worldview. 
But the problem is that there were people there who were opposed to what they were doing, and they didn't really think that uh, the people should be exposed to a non-religious worldview. And there were so many people that complained about it that eventually they decided to cancel the contemplation, the contemplation program altogether. So uh, back then, those were the types of problems you had to deal with if you were trying to present humanism or skepticism on the African continent. But since then, we've come a long way. Uh, since then, we've, we have uh, humanists and skeptics groups all over. Uh, one of the most impressive uh, groups I've been to was the skeptics group in, in Senegal. And I went to Senegal back in 2008, and Leo Igwe was there as well. And uh, it was the very first skeptics conference they had on the continent. And it was very well attended, and it was uh, covered by the major media. And there were also major scientists there who expressed interest. And uh, they had uh, some major science popularizers there who were also expressing interest. And one thing that was very interesting about it is that they had a, they'd been able to establish strong contacts with very young people in elementary schools. And uh, they, were, they were looked up to as scientists by some of these young people. They were able to go there, and we were able to present them with books. Uh, back then, we had a, a, a children's book on skepticism. Uh, came out by Prometheus Books. And we were able to hand those out. We were able to give them gifts such as uh, notebooks and other things to help them with their studies. And so in that way, the skeptics were reaching out to very young people. And they were doing so in such a way that the young people were responding not only to them, but, but to, to their message. Uh, there was a similar uh, program in Uganda. In Uganda, they have a few humanist schools. And I went to one school in which they had a skeptics, a, a skeptics meeting, a skeptics group. And they were meeting on a regular basis. And so uh, over there, uh, we were able to talk to very young people. Uh, Leo and I went to an elementary school in Gambia and we were able to talk about skepticism there. The teachers, they were very open to what we had to say. The students were very interested. And uh, Leo, he gave a very good presentation in which he had copies of the Skeptical Inquirer, and he was giving them out to people, not for answering questions, but for asking questions, you know, thereby promoting the importance of critical inquiry and skepticism. And so uh, in Africa, uh, you have a lot of young people who are interested in skepticism and humanism. In the United States and in Europe, you'll find that many of the organized skeptics and humanists are, are older. But I just received an, an uh, email from Leo a couple days ago in which there's a group of, of humanists, free thinkers, in, in Kenya now. And uh, there's a new group. It's a, it's a Facebook group. And they're coming out in droves. And the, uh, it was pointed out in that article that in Kenya, the average uh, non-believer is only 20 years old, whereas in Europe and, and uh, Japan, it's like 34 years old. So for some reason in Africa, very young people are very much interested in skepticism, and so that looks very encouraging, and they, they need uh, us to be involved and to help them to grow and to do certain things to, to help them to, to make a dent, because they have so many superstitions and so many problems that it's hard for us to relate to. For example, we were talking about witchcraft, and, and Leo will discuss some of that later. Uh, witchcraft hasn't been a problem in the United States for centuries, but all over Africa now, uh, in Malawi, in Nigeria, uh, Kenya, and numerous other countries, you have women and girls who are persecuted and, and accused of being witches. And uh, that's re one reason Leo likes to focus so much on witchcraft, because uh, though this is the problem that hasn't uh, risen in Europe or the United States uh, in centuries is a very big problem in Africa today. So that would be their, their uh, uh, focus. Uh, there's a group in Malawi, and uh, the group now is headed by a man named George Thinwa. And George Thinwa uh, has his own challenge, whereas he is offering a lot of money to anyone who can uh, prove that they have the powers of a witch. He asked people from all over Malawi uh, to, to bewitch him if they have the power to do so. And uh, just like uh, with uh, Jay Ref and, and uh, the Center for Inquiry, uh, his money is very safe. Uh, people have come out, people have, uh, have said that they, they have the powers, but so far no one has passed the challenge. So uh, it's good to see that in Africa, uh, they're having the same types of uh, presentations uh, that you'll see in the Western world. 
But some of their superstitions are, are very strange. Uh, for example, when I was in Africa back in 2008, I learned that they have superstitions against girls eating eggs. I don't know exactly why that is, but for some reason, girls are not supposed to eat eggs. Uh, they had superstitions about girls playing sports. So uh, girls are not supposed to be involved in sports. But in response to that, there's an organization in Uganda called the Woman of the, of the Free World Organization. And uh, these women are humanists, and they're promoting humanism to young girls on a regular basis. And what they've done is come up with a, a soccer club called the Amitos Girls Soccer Club. And uh, this is, as far as I know, the only humanist soccer club in the world. <laughs> and uh, they go around, and it, it's very good because in the United States, you know, we have Title IX, and, and uh, young girls are out competing in numerous sports. But in Africa, it's still taboo in certain places for girls to be involved in sports. So uh, I was able to inaugurate the Amitos Girls Soccer Club uh, back in 2008. And it was very exciting to see these young girls for the first time running around in their soccer uniforms and kicking brand new soccer balls. And uh, you know, to them, it was, it was extremely liberating. It's something they, they couldn't take for granted, but it's something that was very empowering. And it was very good to be a part of that. So it's, it's good to see that uh, over there, they're trying to fight superstition through sports. Uh, they fight superstition through plays, uh, through music. And our music is very big over there. And a lot of times in, in a lot of these humanist gatherings, you'll have good music. I remember back uh, when I helped to uh, organize in Nigeria the first major humanist conference in Sub-Saharan Africa, in which uh, Leo uh, invited some uh, very good singers and some of the best dancers I've ever seen. And it's this type of entertainment that goes a long way to promote skepticism and humanism in Africa. So in different parts of the world, uh, people are drawing upon different experiences and uh, they're drawing, up, drawing upon their cultures in order uh, to help them pr promote humanism, skepticism, and free that. Uh, there are also uh, superstitions over there and uh, conspiracy theories that are very dangerous. Uh, back in 2005, um, you had Muslims in northern Nigeria who were in opposition to um, treatment for polio. At one time, Nigeria had uh, eliminated polio altogether, but you had uh, Muslim extremists in Nigeria who were coming out and saying that their children should not be, uh, should not get the uh, polio vaccine. And as a result, uh, polio came back to that nation. But not only did it come back to Nigeria, it also spread to other nations. And you had Nigerian Muslims who were making the Hajj to Mecca. And as a result, when they went to Mecca, they were spreading polio. And so uh, a lot of these conspiracy theories uh, aren't just irrational, but they're extremely dangerous. And it's important that whenever we have skeptics in Africa who are willing to, to, to take on this type of conspiratorial thinking, that they do get the support here in the United States that we can give them. You also have AIDS deniers in, in Africa. And uh, Gambia, uh, their president, uh, President Yama, he came out and uh, you know, he, he had all types of conspiracy theories. And when you have the president of a country who, who's into the, the um, AIDS denial, you know, that's different than having just some crackpot uh, from, you know, from a local town or what have you. So uh, you've had the same type of problem in South Africa uh, a few years ago when uh, President Zuma uh, was, was in a, uh, and power, you know, he was promoting this, you know, all types of AIDS nonsense, and uh, you know, this is this is a problem that isn't only in Africa. You see it in the United States, and among African Americans, you have a lot of people who buy into the AIDS conspiracy theory that AIDS was created in a lab specifically to target African Americans and gays, and uh, you know, this type of conspiratorial th conspiratorial thinking. Uh, occurs uh, in the United States, not just among African Americans, but among Americans in general. Uh, and among white Americans, uh, there are people who, as you know, used to buy into the birther uh, conspiracy theory, and some still do. So a lot of these uh, conspiracy theories are, you know, they have a racial component. You know, sometimes uh, black people will buy into certain conspiracy theories, and sometimes white people will buy into certain conspiracy theories. 
But uh, as, as skeptics, uh, it, it's good to, uh, to support those who are out there fighting against those conspiracy theories. And uh, I, I'm happy that I was able to be involved uh, to, to, to a large extent uh, in Africa and, and helping to bring this about. Uh, there are also other parts of the world in which uh, skepticism has taken root or which needs to take root. I mentioned earlier about uh, Latin America. I had a chance to go to Latin America, to Peru, uh, to Argentina, and to some other nations, and they're doing very good work down there as well, promoting skepticism. I went to uh, uh, some major conferences in Peru and Mexico and uh, in Argentina. And it's good to see that uh, we were able to unite various uh, humanists throughout, throughout Latin America about, about four or five years ago. Uh, we had a major federation of uh, Latin American humanists. So it's good to see that uh, humanism uh, and skepticism are taking off in other parts of the world. For so long, it was just something you would see in Europe or, or the United States. But now, it really is an international movement. Last year, I went to the first major humanist conference in the Philippines. And uh, I was there to promote humanism, but my brother helped to, uh, to put forth that group. He helped to establish it. And he asked me to discuss skepticism because he said over in the Philippines, there are so many uh, paranormal claims which seem to be uh, just as big as some of the religious claims. Uh, Philippines is the only predominantly Catholic nation in Asia, but they still have beliefs in witches and ghosts and goblins and in vampires. And so uh, they, they are in need of skepticism, and they would like to have uh, people support them with skepticism, sending them literature, uh, sending people over there to speak with them. And they have a very good uh, movement going over there in the Philippines now. Just uh, last month, they had uh, a major conference of uh, not just Filipino humanists, but they had people coming in from various parts of Southeast Asia, from Thailand, uh, from China, Japan, South Korea, and numerous other parts of the world. So skepticism and humanism are growing. And uh, you know, I think that one of the things we can do most is to respect the way uh, that people in different parts of the world promote skepticism, rather than try to impose uh, what we believe uh, needs to be their way of, of responding to skepticism, to understand that uh, they can promote it in their own way, but to be there to give them the support that they need. Another thing we could do is to help provide websites. Uh, I'm with the Institute for Science and Human Values, and uh, there are a lot of people in poor countries who just don't really have, have access to websites, but if we can help, to help them provide websites, uh, they can get their message out there, and um, you know, it really goes a far away. So uh, th those are a couple of things that I think we can do. Um, uh, I'm, I'll be interested in hearing from everyone else during a, a Q&A session. I think right now Leo is about ready to go, and so okay. <laughs> thank you. Yes, you. <laughs> thank you, Noah. Yeah, um, thank you, friends. Uh, we're, ha we're having some problems setting up the PowerPoint. So, but um, I have something I have written out, so I will I've just make my presentation, and hopefully maybe we, we sort out that. Just a moment. Well, Do we need skepticism in Africa? Do we need science? Do we need critical thinking? The answer is yes. And I'll tell you uh, three stories. One personal, one that maybe concerns a country, Malawi, then one that concerns um, one about Nigeria, and uh, of course Ghana where I'm doing my field work. Now, when I was 10 years, uh, two of my cousins came to our house early in the morning, and they beat my father to a coma. What happened? There was a rumor that um, my cousins wanted to use my mother for money rituals. 
money rituals. In other words, in my, in my country, Nigeria, they believe that you can use human body parts and go to a witch doctor, and the witch doctor will make you rich. Yes. So when there's such, such speculation, people are always afraid. People are always, you know, there's this tension and all that. So I was asking my father, what happened? What happened? They told me, oh, you will not understand. 15 years. I will not understand. 20 years. 30 years. I will not understand. What is this thing I don't understand? Under what condition? How can you, how can you produce money using human body parts? Now, this is in, in a part of Nigeria where you have some of the poorest people. They still believe you can make money using human body parts. And because of that belief, from time to time, you see maybe along the streets, in the bush, and you will see some people you know, mutilated. You see the bodies of people with our heads, without the genital organs, without intestine. And I, I, and I, I kept asking this question. What are, they, what are they using human body parts for? What are they using human genitals? Under what condition will they turn to money? Nobody was ready. Nobody could, to, could tell me, uh, uh, could answer this question for me. Now, there was also this belief that some people could you know, destroy others or kill others spiritually. Now people keep dying of hunger, malaria, other diseases, accidents, but they still believe that they could kill some other people spiritually. How? So these are questions. I was asking these questions and nobody was ready to give me answers. So as I was growing and I found out that people were not ready to provide answers, then I started inquiring, I started investigating. That's how I slowly you know, moved, you know, uh, got into the humanist, skeptic, free thought movement. Now, and I found out that it was not only in my country, it was also in other countries. In 2008, I went to, I went to uh, Malawi. In Malawi, they told me that over 50 people, over 50 women were in jail. What, what did they do that they were in jail for witchcraft? Now, how did, how did they get into jail? How did they try them? And they told us that maybe some children confessed in court, and the confession was accepted as evident, and they were convicted. So I told, I told the, the, uh, our local contact to organize a campaign. We launched a campaign in Malawi. And friends, within one year, 45 of around 50, some, of around 50 something women who were in jail were released. And within the next six months, or within two years, all of them were out of jail. Because there was no case. Because I told, I, told, I told our local contact person, I said, there's no case here. In Malawi, witchcraft accusation is a crime. But you know, we, when people keep quiet, the judges will now look at the case, and the people that should be in jail will be out of jail, and the people that should not be out, of, should be out, outside the jail will be in jail. That was exactly what happened. But, but they needed a voice. Someone has to speak out. And immediately somebody spoke out, they just released them. That's what happened. But there are places where people are still not speaking out. For instance, in Ghana, where I'm currently doing my field work. In Ghana, witchcraft is a crime. And you have, in Ghana, there's the belief is that you can kill somebody spiritually, you can cause accidents spiritually, you can cause divorce, any problem, you can, you can, you can, you know, cause that spiritually. You know, uh, the belief there is that when something goes wrong, when anybody suffers misfortune, they, they, they believe that there is somebody spiritually behind that. Now, they have a witch camp. Okay, I'm alive now. <laughs> Good. So now, this is a shrine. 
where people accused of witchcraft are tried. This woman was tried by this young boy by the end there. And this is the broom they use. And this broom is believed that with the broom, you can, the gods can catch somebody who is a witch. We are talking about fakery. How do we fight fakers? Friends, these are the fakers. These are the people who provide fake claims of witchcraft. They call them the soothsayers. And right here, because when somebody dies, they will go and bring the soothsayers and ask them to uh, identify who killed the person. That's what they were, that's what they were doing here. There's another soothsayer. He uses cowries. And when he throws it on the ground, he will be staring at it as if there's something he's seeing. He's seeing nothing. But he'll be looking at it, and you'll be taking him seriously. And he'll be shaking his head as if there's something he's communicating with. It's fake. But people will go there, and they will tell him, oh, that old woman in your family is responsible for the problem. How did he know through the cowries? Friends, you can see that they also advertise. The traditional shrine and harvest center is here. Any problem you have, the shrine master is there to help you. Now, do you know the irony? The shrine master doesn't speak English. So I was wondering who set up this signpost. Good. Now, I went to a witch camp where people accused of witchcraft are driven uh, where, they, where they are settled, where they take refuge. And I saw this. Eggs, red cloth, and all that. And I was told that a soothsayer must have done that, must have recommended that. They will put it at a crossroad so that somebody could use that maybe to ward off misfortune or, and all that. Inside the witch camp. Now, they have seven camps in the north of Ghana. This is one of the camps. They have a chief. They have a chief priest. There are around 113 of them. Some of them have their children with them. They are only women, and they live in single huts. They engage in farming and fetching firewood in order to get, uh, gain their daily bread, and are supported by two NGOs. This is the second camp. This one is managed by a woman. She's a priestess. They live in huts. There are just five of them. There are no children there. This is the, the other camp. It's called the Ngani camp. This is the only camp that has men. They have o over 80 men driven up from their communities. And they live in huts and makeshift shelters like this. This is the Gushegu camp. That's another camp. It's also located in a, a very remote part of the northern region of Ghana. And we have some people who settled in the communities and some people who settled in the land allocated by the chief. It has no priests and there are no rituals. This is the Nabuli camp. It's also um, one of the camps um, they created when there was a local conflict. And those who belonged to a particular tribe had to move away because of the conflict. This is a passing camp. That's another place. Women settle, it also has its spirits. But the huts were renovated by a, an NGO called the World Vision. I think it's a faith-based faith organization. And they, they live in a particular section of the village. This is the Gambaga camp. And that's the oldest camp. That was the first camp where it all started. And um, here, they have a hall. And um, the infrastructure, I think, is better here than you know, than in other camps. The chief is not only the political head, he's also the chief priest. And uh, they are, they're active in politics. They voted in election. They're also supported by local NGOs. And um, the Presbyterian Church is active in this very camp. Now, there is what they call the child witch camp. Disabled children are abandoned. They are branded evil children and are thrown away. So there is a particular camp that takes care of these children. And some of the children I saw there have problems with their legs and they have um, 
problem, you know, with the, they were born disabled and, uh, and have different uh, um, problems, health problems and all that. So they are kept in this camp because they were abandoned by their families. They said that we children, they are evil children. Now, this woman was accused by the daughter. The daughter was ill for, several, for a long period and accused the mother because she saw the mother in the dream. Immediately you see somebody in a dream in the north of Ghana, that is evidence, incontrovertible evidence for them. Now, what do we do? In terms of what we're going to do, I'm, making, I'm suggesting that we provide training for our contact persons in these camps. If you go to the camps, there's no record of anything. When did this camp start? It started before our forefathers. When? Nobody has the idea of the date, how, number, and all that. So I'm proposing that we're gonna, we, we should develop a database and assess the needs of the people in the camp so that we know how to intervene. I'm also proposing a, a, a dialogue with the accusers and the accused. Because people keep going to the camps to settle. There are no structures there. There are no support system, systems there. So I'm also thinking that there's a need for us to go back to the communities and try to uh, dialogue with them and see how we can stop the problem. For instance, this man was seen in a dream by a child. The child I'm holding here. He was, he was seen in a dream by a child, and he was driven out by this community. The community members are right there at the background. So, and I have been telling them that, that you see somebody in a dream doesn't mean the person is responsible for any problem you have. But for them, they cannot listen to that because of what they believe. Now, these are the fakers. You know, when we talk about witchcraft, we think that it's all about women. This is a, a witch finder who is a woman. I visited her. And this is a soothsayer who is a man. So sometimes you also see women involved in uh, witch hunting and in identifying witches. Now, we need to support the victims. Some of, this is an old woman I met coming back from the stream and all that. And I was wondering how many times this woman will go to the stream with a walking stick. So some of them also are living in makeshift shelters and all that. So they need some support in order to you know, live comfortably at least till the time they will return home, if, if ever they will. So I also propose that we have some kind of dialogue with the families so that to reason them out of the superstitions, to reason them out of the rational beliefs um, is really challenging, is difficult, because in most cases it involves death or diseases. And um, I was with a family some weeks ago, and they were telling me they were furious. They said that another family killed their brother, and, that, and they were asking me, do you believe that somebody can kill another person spiritually? And I asked them, with what? If you kill somebody spiritual, what did you use? Machet? Gun? Stick? Yeah. So they believe that, even though they can't tell you what exactly the person used. So there's a need for some kind of dialogue. Then we have to dialogue with the youths. Many of the young people grow up with this belief, and they go into mob action immediately against anybody who is accused. We have to build trust with local leaders, because many of them are the ones that arbitrate, they judge, they handle these cases. So we have to build trust with them as a way to get, gain access in terms of dialoguing with the communities. So how can American skeptics help us? Yes, you can adopt a camp. You can also choose to support somebody in the camp, in any of the camps. So you can visit uh, or volunteer to assist the victims. You can also fundraise for us, because we need all this in order to get, get on with our work. Again, how, what else can you do? You can help us publicize the programs, post the news and reports on your blogs, put them on your website, propose it as a topic of discussion, draw the attention of your congressmen and women to the situation, draw the attention of a human rights group or a development agency uh, in your area to this issue. That's how you can help us. Yes, because sometimes the world doesn't know what is going on. They just think, oh, yeah, Africa and witchcraft. How? What are the details? Yes, it's important that people know graphically what is going on. It's a tragic situation, it's a humanitarian disaster, and it's as a result of irrationalism and superstition, and we need to let the world know that we need to use this opportunity to make a case for reason in Africa.
So, what else can you do? Keep supporting J uh, Jeref. And um, as I was going around, I saw this hospital, Amen Scientific Herbal Hospital. <laughs> so when you visit, so in case you take ill, this is a hospital of interest. They provide safe and effective complementary and alternative medicine. And if you look up there, you know what, they are, what is their motto? God is the healer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. We have been reached by Sanal at the Maruku, and uh, yes, an applause. Where is one? Where is the first? Maybe you're back here. Oh my goodness, this is. First of all, apologies for coming late because I've been traveling 30 hours to reach uh, Las Vegas from Helsinki. That's a new abode where I'm living. Uh, I moved to Helsinki, as you know, uh, a year back because the secular India, where in the Constitution it is demanded from all citizens to have scientific temperament critical inquiry and humanism as their fundamental duties, if you expose a miracle, it could be disastrous for you. I, I did not know this thing for a long time. And the situation is getting quite worse in India these days. Uh, uh, for example, last 30 years, I have been campaigning. I've been reaching out people. We have so many different wonderful active groups in India. And uh, we really reach out to people at, at villages. In India, for example, we have um, a million villages where the people are shattered in small places. And 80% of the population lives in the villages, not in the urban area. So 1995, we initiated a special campaign to reach out people. Because till then, we thought discussions, academic uh, dialogues and all, which make some impact because that will educate more people to reach out people. But we de really decided to go to the people and really talk to people. And that was a novel idea. And we all were quite young people at that time. And uh, lack of resources, of course, for such a gigantic program, we thought of reaching out a 1,000 villages in uh, 100 districts and selected in, in, in we have 400 districts. And 100 villages would be covering almost one fourth of the population is what we thought. But how did you do it? We didn't have money. So we had one van, 18 people, and I mean some funds to start with. And we just went village to village, talked directly to people, asked or understood what exactly are the kind of superstitions and, and kind of paranormal beliefs that, are there, that they are living with. But the kind of things in India are, I mean, it's un unbelievable if you go to a village. The entire population lives under the influence of astrology. The life is controlled with astrology, and the gurus and local holy men, and we have quite a lot of them, nearly 100,000 holy men we have in India, everywhere scattered. And they control the lives of the, the individuals. And once you are in, con in contact with the guru, he controls your entire life. For your marriage, for your uh, child's education, everything is, I mean, advised by these people. And they are quite professionals to keep you under the control. And these people are known as tantrics also. They are considered very, very powerful. And their winning point is all of them could do a lot of magical things. So they could produce holy ash by a movement of your hand. Or they could spit fire. Small things which uh, a primary standard uh, I mean, science student could easily do. But the villages simply take it. But not only villages. That's one thing which we have been shocking all the time. For example, India has a very powerful space research. Uh, when, when a satellite is launched, even last week when a satellite was launched, the chief of Indian Scientific Research Institute makes a replica of the satellite and makes, makes special prayers where, not in a temple, but in the scientific institute, and brings a, I mean, a, a holy man there 
and makes a, a special worship to avoid all obstacles. What they have to do is to make a coconut break in front of the elephant-faced goat, and he will look at, get, take care of it. And the time is not decided by scientists in most cases, but by astrologers, auspicious time. So that's, that's the level of uh, superstition that is existing in India. But down in villages, the, the real people who are affected, we thought of reaching out them first. And uh, this campaign has made the work of the Indian rationalists, uh, I mean, that's a term we use in India, uh, I mean, quite well known in the country. Uh, we reached out villages and villages, talked to people, 25 people, or 100 people, or 300 people, I mean, small groups, and it simply spread like wildfire. And after 20 days, we found that we are hitting the newspapers. We didn't plan it, but every local newspaper was reporting it because it was attracting a lot of people. And by one month, I got a call from BBC. I mean, it's already reported internationally. The campaign is going like a wildfire everywhere because we equipped everywhere 10 or 20 young people and asked them to go to the next places with their friends and replicate it. The, the idea was we go to one place means we should be able to replicate it at 10 places in the next two weeks. So it was spreading so wi widely. And uh, BBC came with us and they traveled with us for some weeks and they made a documentary namely the Guru Busters. So that was you can see, I mean, in that thing, the, the initial part where we are having 300 or 400 people, at later part, thousands of people. I mean, everywhere, I mean, the news was so well and reached out so well, and we became a national presence in India. And this encouraged a lot of people. The movement is very active, very vibrant, and uh, uh, now in the television times, we are in television everywhere. We have uh, nearly 200 television channels in India in all languages, and the activities are reported, but also very active dialogues and discussions are going on openly, and they've got the courage now. 20, 10, 20 years back, when the first televisions, private televisions came in India, we had only one television before that, the national television, the government's television. So there only government programs are reported. So then when the private televisions first came, they were afraid, for example, when they interviewed me, I should not use the word Satya Sai Baba, that's a very famous holy man who died recently. That was the first advice I got, because that can be stopped. I should not use the word. And I should not use any word, Hindu, a miracle man, these kind of words. Without that, I should speak. That was the situation 20 years back. But now, imagine that my kind of a very outspoken person appearing something like 250 television programs every year, and directly encountering all these kind of people. And uh, it can be at many places. This has provoked a lot of discussions, I mean, a lot of uh, uh, momentum in the whole structure. And uh, uh, it's generally considered that there's a silent revolution happening in India. Not seen outside, not seen publicly, but the, in, in the roots of India, big change is happening. And therefore, last two years, we see a lot of opposition coming up in very different ways. For example, anybody who is emerging powerful are tried to be stopped. So especially when you come out from a television studio, I heard news that in Andhra Pradesh, one of our friends have been attacked outside. So I was never fe facing such things. Or somebody publishing a small booklet, translating legally not banned literature. He's just arrested for that, hurting somebody's religious sentiments. So then we found uh, in 2009, a, no, a, a law is being used against rationalists at different places. It was small test doses at different places. Uh, we have a constitution made in 1950, but the laws in India are made in 1860 during the colonial times, the Indian Penal Code. And it has a law that tells that if anybody hurts the religious sentiments of anybody, and if I feel that my religious sentiments are hurt, all I have to do is to make a complaint I can be arrested without an arrest warrant. I need not be produced to a court of law immediately. I can be kept for my safety uh, any, any number of days in, 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 in the custody, or uh, I cannot apply for a bail. It's non-bailable. Such a law existed, but never used. So at many places, we found that this law is, I mean, tried at local places. So we 
try to respond it slowly and try to start educating people how to, I mean, how to fight it out. But uh, the test doses which, which was tried at different places was in fact aiming at a larger thing. So it came to me later. That was, uh, I mean, I have uh, publicly exposed the most powerful holy men in India, like Satya Sai Baba when he uh, came to, uh, I mean, Delhi and performed his miracles in front of a, I mean, huge audience. He moved his hand and produced holy ash, and the prime minister visits him, or the, the, the at one time we had the prime minister, the president of India, the chief justice of India, the speaker of the uh, uh, parliament, all were his disciples. And at the same time, I could go to another television channel when this report is coming and publicly say that he's a fraudster and I can replicate whatever he's doing. And I had listeners and I mean, that was possible in India. So I was very proud of a secular India where freedom of speech is guaranteed. A lot of stupidities are there, abnormal stupidities are existing, but I have a right to fight it out. And I'm capable of doing that. I'm capable of mobilizing people and I was so sure India was changing, and it has been influencing the whole population. But uh, uh, last year, when a comparatively smaller Christ Christian community in India, we have only 2% Christians in India, but quite powerful. Uh, the Catholic Church is especially very, very powerful because of uh, the political connections. Uh, the chief of the ruling party is a Roman Catholic coming from Italy. Uh, she was the wife of one of the former prime ministers. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the Catholic bishops feel that they're very, very powerful. And the whole political system, which is absolutely based on psychophancy, does not take an arm up against anything that, that could touch the Catholic Church, because that could you know, eventually hurt the leader. That's the kind of mindset people have. So. I, with the background of a, a, a Catholic father and a Hindu mother, I knew quite well about the Catholic structures otherwise. Uh, I have gone to Mumbai to see a miracle which was getting very popular very fast. A, a crucifix was leaking water from the feet. And they said, Jesus is weeping. And why should he weep? No one knows, but uh, some water drippers were coming in from the feet. So I've gone there. Uh, and you know, later when I see how, how carefully they have been, they have invited me, because I've spoke about this, and the church invites me to come and study, and, and, and uh, after, after you should have empirical evidences about what you're speaking, so we welcome you to come. This is what they publicly said. So therefore I've gone, with their permission I've gone there, and the moment I reach there, the priest comes to me and gives me a small hammer. Why don't you hit the statue and see if there is some water trapped in? I immediately knew what is meant. If I take the hammer in my hand, and I mean, if I'm a fool, I would just hit the statue, they could take 100 photographs. Next moment, say, they say that we didn't permit it, and he has been trying to smash our statue. That was the intent. Very clear, and I immediately understood, I refused. Then somebody says that one of your assistants can dig the floor and see whether, whether it's water. All intended to trap me. I, I smelt it at that time also. But I decided, because there was a television crew with me, and uh, I've verified the whole area, and I found that, um, well, they've been distributing this water. There was a prayer going on when I reached there, and they've been giving water for people in their palm. They could lick it. Everybody was drinking the water. Brought to me also, I refused to take it, but I asked for a sample, which later proved that it has E. coli bacteria. <laughs> Quite a lot, a million times uh, more than human tolerance. Uh, and uh, what I found was the, the most interesting thing at that moment. I went behind. The, the statue, and there was a wall, and there was a small toilet there. And the toilet had a lot of leaking water from sides and coming through small drainage pipe. And I went through the drainage line, and everywhere where it goes on the wall, there is, I mean, wetness, dampen, and, and, and algae is growing there, which means there was water present for quite some time, and it was all leaking. I followed it. And it came just behind the statue on the wall, there it goes down to be connected to the drainage. It's just toilet water going on there. Then there was a cover for it. And by force I removed it. It was stinking terribly. It was just toilet water blocked there. And that is what was sucked up with capillary action. And uh, like, like uh, I mean, and then on the wall it was pre present. 
and then I went to the statue. On the feet, there is a nail to fix Jesus there. I mean, and before that, above that, there is no water presence. And from the nail down, there is water. So, the, and it was a cement base, and the cement walls were taking up water, and this has gone up and drained through the nail hole and drained through the feet. So I collected the sample, and it proved that it is just toilet water, and nothing else, and that has been officially you know, given to people to drink, to cure their ailments. <laughs> and uh, once I understood this thing, they wanted me to explain it publicly to the audience there. Again, that was another trap to attack me there. Uh, I refused to talk there, because I, I knew I mean, what I understood. And I had documentary evidence with photographs and uh, all, all, I mean, all, all details I've collected. So at 9 o'clock prime show, I was invited in the television to speak about this. Uh, of course, the church asked them to stop it, that I should not speak. The channel decided to go with the program. Uh, but uh, they have agreed that after 10 minutes that I get to explain this thing, there will be a dialogue, a discussion, where church representatives also can and defend their miracle. So they sent not one person, but five people. The priest, the, the trustee of the local church, a, a Supreme Court, the, the federal court advocate, five people came on the other side. I explained in, 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 in 10 minutes with photographs and pictures and small videos. And it worked very well, because on an average, a thousand people have been visiting this, this crucifix to witness it every day. And the next day onwards, there was no single person going there. <laughs> the miracle is over. It's wound up completely. But I had to run away from the country. Uh, the next, in the, in the television discussion, uh, the five people came so hysterically and they defended the miracle, telling that water will never climb up. I mean, God's law is that water goes only down. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a scientific absurdity that water can climb up through capillary action. These kind of arguments go on in live television. And they say that holy water works. It has cured people. Cancer was cured. Other ailments were cured. And a limping person was walking. All this was water. But uh, half the way, I think the bishop understood what damage these people are making. And the bishop himself wanted to be in the program. And the bishop joins the program half the way. The Mumbai bishop uh, comes for a dialogue in the discussion. And uh, he starts with one sentence. Well, you are ignorant. Everybody is born ignorant. And I countered it simply. Sir. I thought, I mean, till now I was told that everybody is born sinner, not ignorant. <laughs> and uh, so it, it started on that. And, and then the, the kind of argument the bishop made was very funny. He said, the whole scientific development in the Western world has been caused, and the reason behind it is Catholic Church. We made it. Because there was a pontifical scientific institute that is responsible for scientific development. I mean, I, I said I, I would, I cannot, I don't want to argue on that thing, but I would like to bring two witnesses from history to answer it. One is Gennaro Bruno, the other would be Galileo Galilei. So then you know what he said? You know what Galileo did? After all, he has apologized. <laughs> he has apologized to the Catholic Church, and you have to apologize too. And I demand your apology right now. If not, you will face the consequences. In a live television program, he asked it. I said, I refuse. Number one, rather you should apologize to the people for distributing dirty water, claiming that it's holy water. The bishop felt angry and he walks out. And of course, when the program was over, there was a small crowd waiting for me outside. And uh, I was kept inside. The channel had came and I mean, we had some dinner inside the studio. Later at four o'clock in the morning, I was taken out carefully from the back door. Uh, and and I, I flew to Delhi. But this was a, a, a well-prepared plan that was, I mean, uh, happening. Next day, 17 cases were filed against me under this old law at 17 different police stations in Mumbai, and which means that if I come out from one case, there is another case waiting. 17 different people at 17 different police stations. It was reported in the press. I didn't take it very serious. I, I did not really think it would work against me because I thought I'm quite powerful. And uh, my, my, I mean, media presence is quite, quite, I mean, strong. But uh, slowly it started avalanching, and uh, the police started contacting me. And I mean, of course, I, I, uh, my lawyers suggested that uh, you have to go. For, there's only one remedy possible. You can go for an, an anticipatory bail, anticipating an arrest. 
you can say that I would like to have a bail. If I'm arrested, it's not bailable. So I go to the court, expecting a, an arrest. I ask for an anticipatory bail. The court, you know, they don't want to touch a matter of faith. They say that, uh, well, they don't re reject my case uh, on merit. They said, technically, since it's in Mumbai, why don't you go to Mumbai and apply for a bail? But by law, I should apply at the place of my residence, because that's where I'm apprehending an arrest. Uh, okay, then, then my lawyers move Mumbai court. Meantime, um, I get an intelligence information from government that I should take a precaution about my security because they have a, a small tip of information that the bishop has paid the mafia to abduct me from Delhi to get arrested in, in Mumbai. Okay. Because if I'm in Mumbai, I can be just arrested. In Delhi, they have to come to the Metropolitan Magistrate and get a permission as per the law. So it's a long process. Uh, the next information what I get is uh, from, from an internet discussion, a, uh, active discussions going on on a Catholic forum, where they discuss that we have to get this guy at least. He's becoming very powerful and too much influencing against our church. And he even criticized Mother Teresa. Therefore, he should be got away in one night if he is arrested. If he's arrested, we should pay any amount of money to a co-prisoner to stop him down. And I'm willing to pay money, somebody writes on the block. So we report to the police and the block disappears next day. And uh, so things were getting a little dangerous and uh, my, I mean, advisors suggest me that I should go, uh, I mean, f out from public scene because it could be very dangerous. So I go underground. Not afraid of police, but afraid of uh, the mafia coming from the bishop. Uh, so I went to some friend's house, sometimes, I mean, very strange places. Nearly two months I lived out from public eye, but the televisions would not leave me. From hiding place, I go to a television studio in the evening, and I speak about the case, and I disappear very fast. I, was, I, I almost mastered the art of doing it, and uh, in hiding from the hiding place, I went into 23 television programs. Sometimes it was all pretended as life. I record, got it recorded earlier, and the evening they presented it as a live program. And many, many times it was so well working. But still things were going on very bad. And uh, then I get the information that the, the bail application in Mumbai is again rejected. The, they are moving the Delhi Metropolitan Magistrate to get me arrested. So then I had a, one small commitment. I had a lecture tour in Poland, which was coming two weeks later. I thought I would leave the country for, I mean, for the time being and stay somewhere and then go to Poland. And meantime, the dust settles down and come back. I, I go to Finland. I, that was a big story which I'll be speaking later about. Uh, I, I swiftly uh, moved to Finland. And meantime, police reaches my home and in search of me. And in almost all hiding places where I've been, it was all followed. Uh, mafia reaches in search of me. And very clear, and there's a case registered about, uh, I mean, unknown people, I mean, unauthorized people reaching places and all. But uh, the media in India responded so well to the case. Something like a thousand articles came. Everywhere it's reported. I've been interviewed everywhere, and I spoke out openly about the whole structure. And I said I would not stop. And meantime, very interestingly, uh, a negotiator emerged. Uh, the Leiti organization, Steve Catholic of Association's president, is in discussion with me some weeks back. So he said the bishop would like to get the cases withdrawn now uh, on a condition, a small condition, that I should apologize. <laughs> if I cannot apologize on behalf of the organization, somebody else can apologize. The first thing that we discussed in our board meeting, which I proceed over the internet, is that if any of our member apologizes on behalf of the organization, he should be expelled from the membership, number one. But no one, not, not a single person would go for that. And I made a public statement that this is not medieval times, and even if you bring all the torture machines that we used from the medieval times, well, here is one person who will not apologize. That's the kind of situation that we are facing. Thank you, Sonal. That's very impressive. 
Um, I think we have run out of time, so uh, we may not have time for questions. But if you do want to ask something, please join the table and, and talk directly to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you.